Hello and welcome to Contramundum. Uh, our topic today will be Ligon Duncan, a big kahuna in the evangelical world and the big evil world and the PCA world. Uh, had a lot of stuff to say recently about all of these right wing Christians and the Moscow mood and all, all of that. Uh, it doesn't like it very much. Uh, and so joining us today is not CJ. That's not CJ. He did not uh, he did not have uh, reconstructive surgery. That is Chase Davis <laughs> here today. So Chase, if you guys don't know him, is the pastor in Boulder, Colorado, a uh, place even worse than Minnesota and maybe worse than California. I don't know. Uh, he doesn't think that, though. He loves it there. Uh, hello, Chase. How are you? I'm good, man. Glad to be here. Yeah, it's not worse than California. We get a lot of Californians, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of <laughs> a lot of good people. Uh, Colorado is one of those weird states, you know, in the middle of a, a lot of migration and yeah. and uh, people moving. It hasn't fared as well as places like Ohio. I mean, uh, Idaho. It has um, suffered just because of the migration. And I did an episode on that on my podcast where people can go hear that. But, yeah, it's uh, it's fascinating. They're trying to pass some gun laws. They're, you know, uh, Marxist in the government. So it's uh, it can be brutal, but it's, you know, it's middle America. It's it's uh, a yeah. it has a very Midwest vibe out in Colorado, believe it or not, even though. It's no, I believe place, it. So. I believe it. I mean, that's, 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 that's what it's like here. I mean, CJ says the thing, same thing all the time about where he lives in, Col- in California, that if you didn't know that it was California, you didn't know like where I live is is, is Minnesota. You would think it's just anywhere, any normal place in America. It's very, very Midwestern, you know, in the, in the rural areas. I mean, just radically different than the big cities. And uh, although Boulder, you know, is a place all its own. (laughs) The most progressive besides uh, I think Aspen, like the ski towns are radical, you know, progressive and they have their own. I mean, you want to get into like some real, micro situations with housing and cost of living and influx of rich elites uh, where they can't even afford their own, you know, proclivities uh, that that's its own ecosystem. But with the university of Colorado, it's obviously the flagship institution. Yeah. Um, it's the emphasis of Colorado. And so, you know, our attitude remains that, you know, as long as uh, we've been here, we've been there in Boulder, I'm on vacation now, but you yeah. know, uh, we got to, got to put a lot of favor upon our church and we're seeing a lot of people come to Christ, come to church and, uh, Amen. yeah, just a lot of, a lot of awesome opportunity, I think. Um, uh, and, uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's a fun place. I love Colorado from Texas. People always when we move back, but I'm very, very happy, <laughs> deep, deep, deep roots planted here now. So, uh, or not here. I'm, I, I, I'm getting confused cause I'm in the beautiful Arizona sun <laughs> and not yeah, eight you're... inches of snow. You're in Scottsdale. Uh, yeah, man. You're on, yeah. you're on vacation. So it's nice. Yeah. But uh, we'll just imagine that it's Colorado. Uh, yeah, right. But our topic today, let me shift over to video here. Let's let's do this. OK, so Ligon Duncan went on this podcast. A few guys have talked about it, but I, I wanted to check it out myself here. So we'll see. We'll see what they got to say. We're back with another- right off the bat. Like the podcast is called Room for Nuance. I mean, give me a break. <laughs> Room for nuance. <laughs> okay. Okay. Room for nuance. Yeah. Let's go with that. All right. Let's see what they got to say. I speeded it up to one and a half because I don't know if I can listen to him drone on. Another episode of the Room for Nuance podcast. I'm Sean with my guest, Luke Duncan. Or as his friends call him, Dr. Duncan. <laughs> Brother, will you ask for the Lord's help as we yeah, get started? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of having a conversation this way that not only involves a couple of friends, but can bring in hundreds of other friends mm-hmm. into that conversation. We pray that it would be glorifying to Christ, that it would help build a church, that it would encourage pastors and church leaders, and that you would give us help. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, they started with praying, so it has to be holy and good, right? They've, uh, they've blessed it. Yes, it is now <laughs> sacred. They can the say whatever they want because they prayed first. All right. Uh, we typically like to start the show just by asking people to share a three to five minute version of their testimony. Mm. Would you mind doing that? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I grew up in a wonderful believing home. My mother was a Southern Baptist from East Tennessee okay. who had uh, done, uh, she, she did her university work at the, the State Baptist College in Tennessee, Carson mm-hmm. Newman, and uh, then eventually went to Southern Baptist Theological Seminary to do a master's in church music and wow. uh, then doctoral work at Northwestern. And then she had directed choirs in Baptist churches in North Carolina, Tennessee, and Georgia, and was called to be the uh, a music professor at Furman University. And that's where she and my dad met. They
they met oh. on a blind date. Uh, dad came from an, he was an eighth generation Southern Presbyterian ruling elder. So mm. I had a, a Southern Baptist mom and a, and a, and a Presbyterian dad. And actually as a, as a young child, I, I was taken back and forth from first Baptist in Greenville to second Presbyterian in Greenville, but eventually was reared under a really wonderful, faithful, uh, minister at second Pres, a man named Gordon Reed, who had a huge impact on my life. Um, I, 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 my mother was always my theological conversation partner and, uh, she was wonderfully theologically read and articulate. And so when I had theological questions, I typically talked with her. I'd been talking with mom about what faith is, what repentance is, what regeneration is, et cetera, probably from the time I was five or six years old. When wow. I was 10, uh, I, I, what I actually did is I, I, we had a, a communicants class at our church where okay. the pastor would take uh, young people. T- I'm going to pause right there for a second, right? Yeah. One thing you notice about yeah. uh, Duncan, and this is this is interesting because he you know gives his background. I, don't, I didn't know it in this level of detail that he, you know, he is, you know, Southern evangelical nobility, right? He is like, he's elite, you know, from birth, he's elite. He's in these elite circles, right? Uh, So his, his mom is a a professor. His dad is, uh, you know, from this, like this high echelon of, of Southern Baptist or of of, uh, Southern Presbyterians. So like he's born into this, right? He's not, he's not an upstart. Right. He's a guy that's no. been been there forever. Uh, I'm going to speed it up even more if you can tolerate it. Let's go to yeah. let's go to 175. This is a long video. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 years old through a gospel. Yeah, he would do a different gospel every year. At the end of that time, if they felt that they were ready to make a public profession of faith, they would be examined by the elders and then they would make a public profession of faith. And I went through, I think I studied the gospel of Mark with him one year. And at the end of that time, even though I had a number of friends in the class, I really didn't feel like I was ready to make a public profession, partly because I knew that it would please my mom and dad. And I knew that, that was not a good reason mm. to make a public profession. So I didn't. And that, so that was that was maybe early fall of when. OK, that's interesting, too. <laughs> I'm sorry to yeah. keep, keep pausing it. Right. Why wouldn't you want to please your parents? <laughs> I know that's that's immediately what I thought. It's like you know, um, there is that question. You know, I I am Baptist, and there is that question even when my sons, when I baptized them recently, how much of this is just to please mom and dad? And it's like, well, that's not a wrong motive. You know, that's good. That that's part of the yeah. admixture of how God forms us. You know, something that uh, that's interesting. That I find I, I I just listened to the clip that we'll get to. Uh, that's a bit shorter. I haven't listened to all this. Something that's interesting is how his mother was so formative in his uh, spiritual life. And you know, I can resonate with that. I think I mm-hmm. I probably had more spiritual conversations early on with my mother. But I I you know, based on what he says later in the video, I I would suspect that his mother motherly instincts in terms of how to relate to others and lead theologically uh, were very deep rooted as well. You know, how you discuss theology, how it comes across. And if his mother's a professor, uh, I don't know about Furman. I I think it used to be a military school, but if his mother's a professor, there's a certain mode uh, of allowed discourse and way to engage. And so Mm -hmm. he's got a mom, a woman who's a professor teaching him, this is how to think and behave theologically. I think that that to me says a lot. Now, what you know, it's not trying to say you know, it's good. Like we can see biblically, it's it's good for a mom to pass down her faith. It's not it's not yeah. wrong, but it, but it's going to shape how we engage the world theologically and uh, and kinetically with Christianity. How we mm-hmm. how we fight, how we don't fight, how we say we can't fight, all these things. So I just think that's really interesting. I I didn't a, know that. Yeah, it's a definitely a tell, um, and, and it's weird. You know, if his dad's a pastor. Right. Why is his dad not the one <laughs> doing the formative stuff? I mean, obviously, when you're when you're very young, you spend more time yeah. with your mother. So, I mean, that, totally. I, I get that. So I don't want to I don't read too much into it. You know, I don't want right. to, you know, do Freudian psychoanal- psychoanalysis no, or anything no. like that. But you're, you're right. Like, that's weird. That's a little that's interesting. That's a little bit yeah. of good background info. Uh, so let's yeah. let's let him keep going really fast. Um <laughs> Both. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, we gotta we gotta go to this guy. Don't trust that Chase guy. He's behind the Jared Moore Michael Clary <laughs> ticket, and he under, uh, associates with other dangerous. Well, he's he's associating with one right now. Another dangerous <laughs> content creator. Um, that's right. All right, let's continue on. Year that next summer, I always spent a month in Titusville, Florida with my grandparents, my, my mom's mom and dad, and they were faithful Southern Baptist members at First Baptist in Mims, Florida. And that summer, Billy Graham did a uh, evangelistic campaign in Orlando, and mm. I listened to him preach mm. all night for like, all, all week for like five nights. In person? Yeah. Not over the they radio? Take, they would wow. take, we, we were not yeah. skipping to jump away from yeah, Orlando. Yeah, okay. So that 
really had an impact on me, just mm-hmm. evangelistic, mm-hmm. direct mm-hmm. preaching. And the pastor of their church was a, a man named Joe Reitmeyer, who was a dear friend of Adrian Rogers. Rogers yeah. and, uh, and so I went to Pastor Joe and just asked him to talk with me about the gospel. And he walked me through the gospel. And when I went back home at the end of the summer, I said, I want to do communicants class again with Mr. Reed because I think yeah. that I'm ready to make a public profession. So I did, we went through the gospel of John that time. Yeah. And at the end of that time, I thought, I'm, I, I understand this. I understand the gospel wow. and I'm ready to make a public How profession. How old are you? I was 10. 10. So uh, that, you know, and it, again, the, the Lord put my mom, my dad, my pastor, you know, godly grandparents, a faithful pastor in Mims, Florida, all these things in my life helped me yeah. receive the word of God. So, One plants, yeah. another waters. Yeah, that's right. The Lord yeah. gave the growth. Yeah. Wow. And how did you A, become reformed and B, lamentably become Presbyterian? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've told Mark. No, they really the same I, thing. I was, digging, I was digging through, I was digging through some, a box of memorabilia that has had probably been unsealed for years. And I discovered my baby dedication hey. certificate from First Baptist to Greenville, South Carolina. And so, I, I sent, I sent a picture of it to Al and yeah, to Mark, you yeah. know, and they, you know, they did the tear emoji back, you know, <laughs> so, yeah, so you close, were doing, you were, yeah, so, so close, close, yeah. You know? Yeah. It's, um, I, I, I always would have been inclined to being soteriologically mm-hmm. reformed yeah. because of my conservative evangelical Presbyterian upbringing. And because mom, frankly, mom knew more theology than dad did. At mm-hmm. that point. Dad was a late, he, dad called on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's just pause right there. I mean, this is before I wasn't going to say, all right, I'm not going to, you know, d- delve too deeply into that. Now, now Chase, uh, I think has a point. <laughs> right? Yeah, no, and it's not, it, it, and just to be clear, the listener who you can, you can read this, you can listen to this and you could listen to it super suspiciously. And I'm really not trying to, I'm just trying to paint. No, he's given us a picture of his spiritual heritage. You know, my question that's going to come up later in the video is going to be, you know, what would Adrian Rogers, what would these people think today? That's been the thing that haunts me, man. It's mm-hmm. like the people that pass down the faith to me, that see the world, that see the left, the radical left, uh, wanting to mutilate children, you know, mm-hmm. and abort them. What would they do? You know, what would they do today? And mm-hmm. I I would not think that their temperament would match Legan's. Yeah. Uh, and so he's he behaves very much like Malib, but we're, we're probably getting ahead of ourselves. But yeah, it, it's it's difficult because with someone's spiritual journey, you know, I grew up an Arminian. You know, I didn't even grow up reform. I was baptized in a Methodist church, christened, and uh, been baptized, rebaptized in a Baptist church. And, we can, uh, we're not going to talk about that right now, but uh, yeah. we're not. <laughs> but uh, but you know, when you look back at your spiritual heritage, I appreciate that he's so respectful to and thankful for the Lord. But I don't know that there's been enough uh, self awareness. He displays an incredible amount of self- lack of self awareness later in the video. So yeah. I don't know that there's no. been enough reflection personally on like, hey, how did my mother shape me in the way I you know, thought, and this is not to disparage his mother passing again. Yeah. But, uh, those are good things. Dare I, yeah. Here I say be nuanced, but uh, yeah, yeah. We're, we're actually being nuanced here, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Let's go back. Ligon Duncan. All right. Onto reading later in life. Okay. And, uh, and, and mom, she was always a reader, always a teacher, always a professor. And she had probably been reared under a moderately Calvinistic pastor mm-hmm. in East Tennessee. Okay. He quotes Which would have been Spurgeon. more common for yes, he quoted Spurgeon yeah. a lot. You can't quote a lot of Spurgeon without yeah. getting the theology of grace mm-hmm. coming through. And so, so reform soteriology was never an issue for okay. me. Okay. And so that was, you know, that, that, that was sort of the fountain uh, for me. I also I memorized the, the Shorter Catechism of the Westminster Confession, which has a beautiful reformed soteriology laid out yeah. in its presentation of yeah. Ordo Salutis and those sort of things. But I didn't understand those things experientially. And right. I, my story is I struggled with assurance from 10 to 14, partly because I was a, I was, I was a confused Calvinist. I, I was actually Arminian in my theology of, of assurance. Mm. And I heard a pastor preach on Ephesians 1 at a youth conference. And it dawned on me that before I had ever reached out in faith to God, he had reached out in grace to me. Praise and, God for that youth pastor. Amen. Oh, for preaching through Ephesians 1. Yeah. You know? yeah. And that was, it was like the lights came on. And now, I, if, I, if I understood the catechism that I'd memorized, I would have already right. known that. But experientially, that wasn't a reality until I heard it from Ephesians mm. 1. And of course, that's how we all, we want to get our stuff from the Bible. Sure. You know, as, as wonderful sure. as our confessions and catechisms yeah. are. I remember Sinclair Ferguson saying, it makes all the difference in the world if you believe something because you read it in Burkhoff or because you read something that you believe something you read in Paul. Right? And, and that is a weakness yeah. of our reformed world. You and know? so th- that was huge for me. And so yeah. experientially, right then, the, the, the theology of grace, it, it just, it was hugely important to me. Wow. And so from that time on, I was very conscious of being reformed. Now, in those days, it's not in the happy days like we have today. Uh, you know, I know there are all sorts of hard things today, but let me tell you, there's, here's, here's one way that's super different. You know, Greenville County had 346 Baptist churches and probably 11 Presbyterian churches. Mm. But there was, not, there was not a Southern Baptist Calvinistic congregation mm. in the county. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and though maybe Calvinism might have been beat up here or there in a passing comment, Southern Baptists in the 1960s and 70s were not paying attention to Calvinism because it just was not, it was not, there was not even yeah. a blip on the yeah, radar screen. Yeah, so yeah. My, my Baptist friends were by default Arminian. Yeah. They, were, they, were, they, they loved the Bible. They cared about evangelism. I want to pause quick and... And, and just think about, like you said, you know, self-awareness and, and reading, reading the way things are 
right? So he, he yeah. he's like, oh, there's 300 and, and however many, you know, churches in this area. And now you look at the demographics and things that they've changed. They don't exist anymore, right? Things right. have declined rapidly. And, and it's, it's funny because like you and I, um, both are, uh, we, we're Calvinistic, right? We're reformed and, and he's like celebrating this, like, yeah, you know, Southern Baptists are much more, um, much more reformed soteriologically than, than ever before all this kind of stuff. This is great, which I mean, in a vacuum, I guess. Yeah. That's, that's, you know, not just, I guess. Yeah. That, that's good. Uh, it's better doctrine, but everything else has declined massively. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So which, which actually is better, right. To have these, yep. you know, Armenian old timey, uh, you know, evangelical Southern Baptist churches that existed in the, in the fifties and sixties when the country was, was far more Christian or like it is now where yeah. a lot of them have a lot better on paper theology, but things are super messed up and in particular in the church. Right. And so I think it's pretty clear what he thinks, right. That things are better yeah. now, right. Even, I mean, he said it tongue in cheek, but like he said happy it. days yeah. now, you know, yeah. That's <laughs> I would get it. And I'm like, no, it's it's not better at all. <laughs> yeah, any, any, anyway. Me, no, give me uh, give me those Ar Arminian zeal for the Lord, passion for the gospel. Um, give me that rather than this kind of academic sequestered version of Christianity, which is very safe and uh, you know not interested in the culture war. Uh, yeah. because that, that, you know, you look at where things are now, what are the biggest battles we're facing now? He thinks it's better now. That's, that's, uh, I understand what he's saying. Mm -hmm. Okay. He's saying doctrinally, he thinks it's better now, but I think it's actually produced a lot of bad fruit. It's yeah. produced a lot of eggheads that don't know how to like fight, don't know how to disagree and don't know how to like represent our faith publicly. Instead, they're yeah. very content to exist in the classroom at Furman university with a nurturing motherly disposition and as long as we've got that we've got our safe space where we can you know fight about uh the decrees of god you know then then we're good that's yeah. happy days and i'm like dude the world's burning down yeah like, like my you know, my state know. right now like my state in, in minnesota last year you know passed a law where they could take your children away from you if you oppose their transition they could just steal your children from you and mutilate yep. their genitals Right. I, I think I know California did the same. I don't know if Colorado has done that yet. I know Washington did. Um, and right now they're deliberating my state about uh, removing religious exemptions for like Christian schools or any any kind of Christian um, you know, universities or, or any any um, even churches regarding um, you know, tra transgenderism and homosexuality, where it's like you just got to you, you have to accept these people as members. If right. they, and you, you'll be sued if, if you yeah. don't right? Th this law, this, the, this uh, legal apparatus that they're setting up in my state where they can destroy churches. And it, and do you think for a second, they're not going to, to use those tools. And these are the happy days, right? Because, <laughs> because why? Because we have more, you know, conservative um, Calvinistic soteriology throughout evangelicalism, like by maybe 10% or something like right. that. That's good. And, and, and the flip side of that is that, yeah, it's just guys studying the head, the, the how many angels could fit on the, the head of a needle. Yeah. Right. That's, yep. that's what it is. It's just all ivory tower stuff. It's not, um, it's not people that want to fight the evil that surround us. Because if you go back to the fifties and sixties in East Tennessee that he's describing and you tell those people, Hey, in, in 60, 70 years, um, you're going to have drag queen story hours in every public library in America. You're going to have, you know, uh, uh, pornography in public schools for children to, to just check out and read in every, every, just virtually every school district in the country. You are going to have, you know, millions of babies murdered um, over, over the next 50, 60 years. Right. How do you feel about that? What do you think you should do something about that? And all of them universally would be, yeah, we got to do something. We can't let that happen. This is horrible. This is evil. Right? That would right. be the impulse, the instinct that they have. And now it's like, well, we want to be, we want to be nuanced. Right? We want to be a little nuanced here. Uh, that's that's the attitude, right? And, and, and this so attitude was pervasive in 2020. This was the thing that really got under my skin. Is you had guys like him who are established elite in evangelicalism, 
And we're on the front lines in ministry. The riots are in our cities. The revolution is ongoing. And we're going, we're calling back to base and we're going, dude, do do? where's the, where's the air support? You know, where it sends some like, you guys are supposed to be cashing the chips. Now's the time, you know, to let's get, let's get after it. And they're going, no, 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 you, we can't do that. And we're like, we're dying on the vine here, guys. Yeah. You know, yeah. you have and, all of these resources. Yeah. And not only that, like Ligon Duncan, it was one of the leading figures in the PCA that said, well, have you, you know, the callback comes, you know, from the front line. And he's at, at command and says, have you tried repenting of your systemic racism yet? <laughs> right? Why don't you give that a shot? Right? Give that's, that a shot. <laughs> you know, that, that's what he's saying to do. And like, oh. this, this is the guy, this is, this is again, all right. He's, he's born into elite Southern evangelicalism, right? He, he's born into it and, you know, ascends to the hierarchy, to the top. And this is what he has to say is right. Just, you know, white people are bad, right? Um, <laughs> white people are bad. Uh, you shouldn't, you should like lock down your churches. You should do all these things and definitely no culture warring. That, mm-mm-mm, no, very no, no, bad. No. Don't be doing that. <laughs> all right, let's get back to it. I'm going to, I'm going to speed it up even more because. Do it. Is, I think we've, we've got, uh, we've got the mental bandwidth to be able to, you know, do with, deal with two times speed. All right, here we go. Um, they cared about the church. Uh, they cared about missions. Uh, they were a little worried about me that I might be a liberal because I was Presbyterian. And that was a pretty good guess in those days because sure, most of the Presbyterians sure. that they would have been theologically liberal. But uh, oh, I, you know, I knew from the time 14 on, I knew I'm, I'm reformed. And so part of what I did is try to make sure that I didn't, that, that didn't end up being the main thing that I argued about with my, with my bad discourse. Well, I, wanted, I wanted them to believe the Bible. It was one thing that was happening was that in, in many of their institutions, the Bible was being undermined. The Baptist colleges, that, yeah. the Baptist seminaries. Yeah. And so I wanted them to believe the Bible. So that, that, if we can get an argument, let's get an argument about the Bible. Let's get an argument about Jesus. Let's yeah. get an argument about the gospel. And so that, that was my MO because when I went off to college, uh, I was at what was still then the State Baptist College of South Carolina. I and the the challenge there was the religion department was Excellent suit trying to talk impressionable young Southern Baptists into rejecting the theology that they had heard preached by their own pastors. Mm -hmm. And their own pastors may have been Armenian and I might have been a Calvinist, but their home pastors did believe in the Bible. They believed in Jesus and they believed in the gospel. Yeah. And so my, I was a member of the Baptist Student Union there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and my whole thing was don't reject the theology that your pastor is teaching you back home. He believes in the Bible. He believes in the gospel. He believes in the deity of Christ. So I had those kinds of relationships, though I, I knew I was soteriologically reformed. Yeah. Again, there, there, were, there, were, there was a small reformed fellowship at Furman University, but not very big. Yeah. It mostly was not Southern Baptist because you had the, the Baptist Student Union had most of the engaged uh, Baptist kids there. And, and they, they were, there, was no, there was no reformed resurgence going on right. in those days. Right. It was, in those days, it was. That, I didn't realize it, but that was sort of in the middle of the battle for the Bible mm -hmm. in the nineteen seventies. Harold Menzel mm -hmm. writes battle for the Bible, and then eventually you get the Council on Biblical Inerrancy. Um, so Calvinism wasn't the thing; it was it was the Bible and then basic Apostles' Creed yeah. kind of Christian doctrine uh, was was what I ended up talking with my friends about. Incredible. I'm, I'm just taking a note because I don't want to forget to ask you about certain things that uh, I'm thinking of <laughs> as you're talking. Okay, so uh, I did something a little different for your interview. I went on our uh, Room for Nuance page and I said, "Who here loves Ligon Duncan?" And everyone said, "We do." And then I said, uh, "And then I said, what are some questions that we absolutely cannot forget to ask?" So I'm going to start there, and then if there's time, because Google will kill me if I don't do this, we're going to get to the regular principle. Okay, Thoughts on the last five years in evangelicalism. Mm. You're a historian. Yeah. You see the way things shift and yeah. move over time. Here we go. Oh, this will be good. <laughs> here we go. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, I, I actually, the, the way I group it timeline is really back to 2012. Okay. I, I think if you read Shadden's yeah. timeline yeah. In, in, his, in his book, I really think he captures it well. I think we've been in a disorienting time mm -hmm. in evangelicalism. And some of that has been the political and cultural polarization that yeah. we're living through. And it's just and, getting into the church. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and it has. And so in some places, the church has just been co-opted by either left or right yeah. and is a pawn. In the in the hands of forces that don't care anything about Jesus, don't care anything about theology, don't care anything about the gospel, yeah. but they have an agenda. It's a political agenda or a cultural agenda, and the church is simply the handmaiden to that. And that yeah. has that has driven some of the polarization. Yeah. Uh, are you hopeful? Oh, I am because I mean, you, you look out at this conference. You've got eleven thousand young people that could be doing anything over their yeah. winter break, yeah. and they're here. And, and I, when I talk to them, the, you know, you think number one, a missions conference, really, eleven thousand eighteen to twenty five yeah. years old are going to come yeah. to a missions conference. But when I talk to them, they say, and, and they're involved in, in organizations, they're involved in crew and university and campus outreach and all these other organizations yeah. out there. And what they say is the content of this conference is more substantial and better wow. than any other place I go. And, and I'm thinking, okay, and, and you're here because you want substance, you want, yeah, you, yeah. you know, and that just makes me happy. And the, mm -hmm. the thing is, I meet, I meet this all over the world because of my job. I'm on every continent about once yeah. every 18 months. Yeah. And, um, and it's, this is there everywhere I go. Yeah. And so I'm very hopeful about that. I, I think, I think 20, uh, 24 is going to bring us another season of, um, discontent. of, yeah, of discontent, <laughs> another winter of discontent and, yeah. and, and polarization. Don't care. Jesus is going to win. Yeah. God's working a plan out. There are good, I, as long as we can get people to really care about the Bible yeah. and really care about theology and really care about the great commission. Yeah. The other things will pale in comparison because when, when you think about the, the things that we have gone through that are part of this polarization, and then you look back over the 200 years of this country, there have been other times when far more catastrophic things have been divided. Whatever us. could you be? Yeah. <laughs> this is the no. most divided we've uh, ever you know, been. Yeah. 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 And, and so I, I think as long as we are discipling 
a generation in a deep commitment to the sole final authority of scripture yeah. to robust historic biblical Christian theology to yeah. an absolute commitment to the great commission. Yeah. The, everything will work out. It, I don't know how, what the timetable of, of that will yeah. be, but the church needs to be discipled by the scriptures and by the church, not by the world. And we're yeah. just struggling right now yeah. with people that are, that are trying <laughs> to play the hand of being, we're the real Christians, but actually importing a worldly outlook and wanting to disciple the church on the left and the right. On with the left that. And, the right. and yeah. we just need to, we're the Bible guys. We're the theology guys. We're Amen. the great commission guys. Yes. And it'll, you know, I don't know when, when we'll get through this period, yeah. but we will. And the, the young people that come to RTS, that come to Southern, that come to Midwestern, and I could go down the yeah, list right. of wonderful institutions where the Bible is believed and theology is sound. Uh, they, they know they're out of step with their culture. Yeah. They know that. And uh, th so they've already taken a step to, to being marginalized mm. and they're okay with that. And, yeah. uh, and, and that that's to an old guy like me, that's very encouraging because my, my contemporaries, we were living in a time where there was at least outwardly evident church growth in mm -hmm. our culture. A lot of that was nominal. A yeah. lot of that was superficial. But because of that, we we bought into worldly aspirations. I'm going to be pastor of a big church. Mm. I want to have a big salary. Mm -hmm. I want to drive a big car, live a big house, and that sort of thing. And you know, I, my young people come come to seminary. They they know that that's not their future. Yeah. Their future may be a bivocational pastor. Yeah. Their future may be planting a church in a bombed out, uh, you know, department store yeah. in a dying small town. You know, yeah. And they're up for that. They just want to be faithful. Yeah. Hold up a second. Let's let's pause here. Let's just pause here real quick. Okay. So, <laughs> um, he's, he's a, se a seminary professor at like RTS, right? Yeah. You know how much RTS costs a year? No. It's like, I think it's like 15 or 20 grand a year. Yeah, that, I think that's right. So, I mean, say it's, say it's 15, that's, you know, 45 K in debt. These guys are going to have, yep. and you're telling them, Hey man, you're going to be a bivocational pastor, right? <laughs> you're yeah. going to have all this debt for this degree and you're going to have to be a plumber, man. <laughs> right. That's what he like front end. This is what you're going to expect, right? That is, right. um, that's something. And, and then on top of that, all right. So that's the first thing off the top of my head, right. That jumps out at me. The other thing is, right. What do we got here? We got people on the left co-opting the faith saying we're the real Christians and people on the right, but we're going to be right in the middle. We're going to yeah. be the, the Bible people that are right in the middle. Well, the problem is Ligon Duncan, that Christianity is true and it comports with reality because God made the world. So Christianity is inherently right wing, right? It just is right. So <laughs> you can't avoid it. You can't avoid being on the right. You, like if you believe in the Bible, then you're you are okay with saying homosexuality is wrong, abortion is wrong, transgenderism is wrong, all these things. Are, well, well, where do you end up when you say those things? Bro, right, on the right. On the right. Um, uh, right. We believe constitutional order is good. On the right. Right. All these things. Crime is bad. You're on the right. Right. Uh. So, <laughs> what are you saying here? Oh, we're the Bible people. We're we're going to stand outside. These petty I heard things. Yeah, I heard that so much when I was raising, um, you know, noise. We'll put it that way. In Acts twenty nine, I heard we're the Bible guys, and I'm like, yeah, but your Bible is just like put on a shelf, and it's not being applied to all of life. Like you're not. He, it, it, it's ironic how much these guys will talk about representing the Reformed faith, right, and representing the Christian faith, and it's like, have you looked back? Have you looked yeah. back at yeah. what they believed and how they behaved politically? You know, yeah. and so the idea that it's a it's you know the word Gnostic gets thrown around, and I don't know if it's most applicable here, but it but it it does remind me of that kind of thing where it's like as long as we have our spirituality mm -hmm. and our doctrine and our Bible, we're good. And look, I can understand what he's saying. It's not that I'm saying those things are bad. What I'm saying is the failure of the evangelical church has been a failure to equip their people politically and yeah. culturally to where the Bible pushes and where the, yeah. the kingdom expands. There are kingdom politics, there are kingdom cultural impacts that the church has failed. Instead, you come to Sunday service, get a hot cup of coffee, get some good vibes, you know, get a therapeutic sermon about how, you know, you're enough in Jesus. I know you don't feel like enough, but you're enough. And like, then you leave and we're good. You go to your small group, you have your group of friends and we're just going to keep our heads down be faithful and of course we want to be faithful of course that 
But notice how he highlighted marginalization. He highlighted that most of these young people are fine with marginalization. And again, in, in a sense, of course, and yet, what if what if we didn't have to be marginalized? <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's a narrative of decline. It's a narrative where yeah. he's accepted, well, the world's going to burn and, you know, whatever happens, happens. But at least we got our Bible. And it's like, yeah. we don't, it doesn't have to be that way. You don't have to accept no. this binary choice, this left, right, in the middle. You can actually apply the Bible to all of that. And there's actually pastors doing this well. There's lots of pastors no. doing this well today. That should be the hope is there's a lot of pastors who are pushing and, and aggressively asserting the Lordship of Christ over all life, both people's holy mm-hmm. personal holiness, both their, you know, I always joke in Boulder, man, you know, uh, higher pastors complain about Trumpists, you know, these <laughs> apparently there's, there's cultists, <laughs> cult people out there that, and you can see that highlighted by NBC and in that MSNBC oh, yeah. if you want, but I haven't encountered them. I've encountered just people who just need to be equipped from the Bible about how to think politically. And that's going to come up later when he yeah. talks about Daniel in, uh, in Babylon and in other places. And, and so there's a lot of preloaded conceptions of mm-hmm. how we are tr- to engage. And it's extremely academic. This is what Frame highlighted, also RTS. Frame highlights, calls it the academic captivity of the church. Yeah. How we've been, we bought into a way that we're supposed to behave, which is subservient to a framework, which is, which is uh, just, hap- just so happens to fit perfectly in the academy an ivory tower yeah. Christianity where as long as we're pure, you know, the world can burn. And it's like, you don't, yeah. do you love your neighbor? Do you want yeah. your neighbor to like suffer and like economic, yeah. do you want economic decline for your neighbor? Do you want their kid to become trans? Do you want, do you want these things? Well, no. What are you going to do about it? You know, I'm going to, you know, share the gospel. Ooh. with them. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah. But like, yeah. there's more, there's so much more. And, and what does that gospel mean? Right. If, if Jesus yeah. is King, that means, He's ruling and he doesn't want this bad stuff happening. And you have to apply what he says is right and wrong to the world in which you live. Right. That is that like just just basic stuff. Right. Uh, it's it, it's mind boggling that they they like, oh, we'll just stand outside. It, like it's easy to do when you are the highly compensated professor of theology at RTS. Easy to tell these kids, hey, hey man. Right. You might have to. You might have to go be an electrician and a pastor and make sure you pay your student debt payments to RTS. Right? Yeah. That's, it's, just, it's sickening, um, honestly. So let's, let's continue on, uh, see if we can get through the whole thing. All right. <laughs> and that can't but encourage me Amen. when I see it. So. I was talking with a mutual friend of ours recently, and I, I was asking him about a, a, an issue in our cultural moment. And he was like, yeah, I'm in India right now with 500 pastors who have no idea what you're talking about, but they're going out and risking their lives every day for the gospel. And even as a historian, you think back, I mean, Arianism, I mean, several centuries of darkness, will the deity of Christ prevail in the church? So this little cultural flare up in, yep. in light of history, in light of what's happening all over the world, there's, it's not, it's not a big reason no. to be discouraged. And I, you know, I get it. These kinds of cultural turns that we're living through, and we're living in through a cultural turn. What happens is Christians have historically gone different directions in how to navigate those cultural terms. Yeah. And I, I can show it to you at, at kind of every age and stage in, in every sort of geographical area of the globe. And you look at China. I mean, one, one reason you have the three self churches and you have house churches is Christians turn, took a different turn in how That's do you right. deal with communism. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm not commending one as, as, as equally good as the other, but I'm right. saying Christians, when, when they're faced with these kinds of totalizing influences and demands from mm-hmm. the culture, mm-hmm. they will tend to go a couple of different directions in how they try to navigate that. And we're seeing that right now. And yeah. the, you know, the big thing in our culture, it's gender, marriage, and sexuality. Yeah. That's that drives so many. You want to pause there? Yeah. Pause it. Yeah. So here's the deal. And here's what's going to come up later. Uh, yeah. However far we get yeah. is I can actually accept these terms because if he were to look at me, this is my, I played the part of this video for my son in the car and I was bantering with it as I do with my son in the car. <laughs> and he's like, you should have him on. And I was like, you know, if I had him on, here's what I would say. Legan, that's fine. You want to run this play, run your play. You have a different play than me. That's totally fine. I'm going to run my play. And we can yeah. bless one another and we can move on with our lives. And I hope it goes well for you. You hope it goes well for me. We're all on the same team. But he doesn't behave that way. No. So, like, if, if, if we had uh, an agreement as Christians, hey, we're, we all have different contexts and different emphases, different giftings, different personalities, and we're going to push in different ways and we're going to celebrate each other as we can, that would be one thing. But he's going to dump on anyone who disagrees with his model, who disagrees yes. with his ways. And he's going to castigate them and he's going to lob grenades like he mm-hmm. says you're not supposed to. And so that's that's what's always baffled me about Big Eva is how they always talk about different contexts, different situations. 
but they're unable to conceive of people in their own backyard who are going to, you know, I'm going to choose a different way to engage culture. And, uh, you know, and they're going to dump on me all the time. It's not allowed. All right. No. Let's let them, let's let them keep going here. Things in our culture right now, whether you're going to be accepted, whether you can be employed, mm-hmm. you know, things of that nature. Wow. Uh, speaking of uh, gender and family and stuff related to that, should we abandon the term complementarianism and start using the term patriarchy? Yeah, I, I think complementarianism is a better term than patriarchy for the very reason that the term was chosen in the first place. I, I get that the term is a recent term, and I think I think John Piper and Wayne Grudem and Mary Cassian sat down one night at a at a, at a hotel mm-hmm. in um, in outside of Wheaton, Illinois, and came up with, "Hey, that's going to be the term yeah. that we go with." So, I, but what what they were trying to say is there, there were already people that were into patriarchy in the bad way that yeah. we see it out there today. Mm-hmm. There were already people like that around, and they, so they want to say, "No, no, we, we don't want to use." patriarchy like that because we're not trying to baptize misogyny mm-hmm. and uh, uh you know an abusive authoritarianism and all this kind of stuff we're, we're we're trying to express what the bible says about the way that men and women are to relate to one another in marriage and in the church yeah and let's i gotta pause i got <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta say it like i mean the whole point of complementarianism is what is the bare minimum that we can get by with and still call ourselves biblical Right. That's that's the entire point. And yeah, like, man, <laughs> we're, you know, were there, you know, whacked out versions of patriarchy, you know, that existed in the in the 70s and 80s and, and whatever. Yeah, of course there were. Um, just as there's always stuff on the fringe that is is weird. But you look and again, he's supposed to be this like professor of historic theology. Right. And you look through you look through the history of the church and what they had to say about all of these issues and how would you define them? They were patriarchal because yeah. that's how all society was. Right. Yeah. That, that men ruled their families, men ruled uh, society, men uh, other than a few exceptions, men were kings and, and rulers. Right. So like the, this idea that, oh, patriarchy is bad. We want, that's just like that's misogyny. Right. We don't want to baptize misogyny. And it's like, yeah, and this is what he does. He accepts the world's accusations as credible and true. He and that drives how he decides how to engage. And and that's what I've I've basically been like, no, like I don't have to. If if a pagan uh, accuses me of being a bigot, you know, uh, I don't have to accept that their terms are both well-intended good faith or true yeah. you know yeah. they can't even define that and so yeah. back then whether you or not you want to use the term still or not there's a good i think there's a lot of good debate going on uh in the evangelicalism about it but he's he's not going to have that debate uh because back then he already compromised on this it was it was all an aim towards the left the left yeah. is a, achieving cultural hegemony in the in the seminaries and the in the institutions and so we're going to create a new word that's non offensive because the goal is to be non offensive. And it's like, yeah. stop running the playbook, you know, yeah. whatever. Well, and, and that's the thing. Like, I mean, I, I talk about this in, in my book that the, the autonomy and the uh, individualization that was rampant, I mean, you've already created conditions for feminism, you know, 100, over 100 years ago, right? You get, the, you get the 19th Amendment, and that's just ratifying what already, you know, began to exist. Um, and so then downstream of that, you have, you have the workplace radically dynamically changing where, where women are brought into the workforce in, in mass um, and the rise of dual income households and everything. Like our, our culture is what it is now. And he's, well, it just has, that's just the way it is. And we have to put up with it. And we're, so we're going to come up with this term that says, yeah, I guess technically, you know, husbands are the head of their households technically and wives should submit to their husbands, but we'll give it a whole bunch of nuance, a whole bunch of caveats where here's the million ways they don't have to submit to their husbands. And we'll call that complementarianism. And that'll be biblical. And that's our nice little third way, our third way to navigate the culture. And it's, what do you know? It just so happens to fit with the post-war political and cultural consensus. Right. Weird how it just we've we've searched through the Bible and timeless theology for a, a thousands of years. And wouldn't you know, it just so happens to fit with where the culture is today. How about that? Isn't that crazy? 
All right, I'll let him let him keep going on this topic. And, um, and so I, I still think Man. the term is a is a good term. Uh, but, but the key of is, of course, that we are teaching the truth from Scripture, and yeah. it is going to be uncomfortable to teach that truth from Scripture, no call matter this, what terminology yeah. Yeah. you use in this culture. It's sort of pick your poison. Yeah. Uh, because people, it does not matter how far you bend over to be helpful and bring people along. It's like no good deed goes unpunished yeah. in in this area. Yeah. And I, I, you've probably all right. So if you get that, why do you even care? Right. Why do you even, if you get that, that, that they're never going to be operating in good faith, they're always going to be attacking, they're always, no good deeds are going to go unpunished, then just call it patriarchy and say it's good, right? Fight fire with fire, right? Just do it, man. Like, I don't get it. We <laughs> seen the thing, uh, Kathy Keller tells the story in, in her, in, in one of her little books uh, that they, they discipled this young woman along at, uh, at Redeemer Church in New York. And complementarianism is one of the things that they teach as part of the core teaching of the, of the church. And this woman gets ready to join and she says, now, wait, um, do we have women as pastors and elders here? And Kathy said, well, no, I mean, we are convictionally, we believe in, in qualified men to serve as pastors and elders. And the woman looks at her right in the eyes and said, I feel like you just told me that my father was a child molester. Wow. You know, so it, it, you know, all of that careful, slow, yeah, sweet right. discipleship, bringing somebody along, and and you're looked at like you are a monster. Mm. And so it doesn't matter what you call it. If 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 you yeah, so why why didn't the Kellerists? Like, I mean, if Ka Kathy Keller is bringing up this anecdote, saying like, yeah, we're we're discipling these people in Manhattan, and they think we're crazy. It's like, well, then, then who cares? Yeah, like who cares if they think you're crazy? They're gonna think you're crazy no matter what, right? The fact that you you didn't buckle on this point. Right, despite the pressure to do so, and probably internally they like really wanted to, uh, but you held to it. They're gonna think you're nuts. So who cares what they think? But they, right. this is this is the point. This is the the mode that they're in, and that you, we could talk about you know Aaron Wren and his three worlds and 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 so forth. But this like neutral world thing where it's like, oh, we got to make it soft and gentle, and make it an easy pill to swallow. And it's like they still spit it out. Right? They they won't they. They're not going to accept this because it is so contrary to the culture that we live in. They just got to embrace it, man. But he doesn't get it. He doesn't. He's, he can't. He can't bring himself to just be like, well, I don't really care. <laughs> you know, yeah, you can't do it. <laughs> You believe what the Bible says. There are going to be some people in this culture utterly offended by that. And I, my personal view about that is that means that you should never put it on the back burner. You need to be upfront with yeah. people. Let me tell you the three things you're going to hate. Get about fired them. in the interview. You know, yeah, yeah, we do that in our yeah, church membership classes. Yeah. Here are the five distinctives. We're complementarian. We're cessationist. Right. We're, you know, yeah, because what we don't want is for you to join the church in a year later and be like, what? What? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Since you brought up Kathy Keller, uh, our, our brother, uh, Tim Keller, has gone to be with yeah. the Lord. Um, man. What a loss. Uh, pr praise God for all the fruit that his ministry has borne. You don't have to agree with him about no, everything no. to appreciate his ministry. Colin Hansen's biography was superb, very useful in understanding uh, why Tim did a lot of what he did the yeah. way he did it. But uh, you are one of the people who's had, I think, two debates with him on the floor of the General Assembly. Uh, I've, only, I've only listened to one and it was several years ago, but can you speak at all to Tim's life and legacy, especially as someone who has had to, you know, go, kind of not really go to the ground with yeah. him, but debate him about things that, that you disagreed on? Right. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, a late comer to Tim that we had occupied the same, you know, tiny, you know, our little corner of the Shire, yeah, uh, right. you know, the PCAs were tiny compared to, to the Southern Baptist yeah. world or the larger evangelical world. Uh, we had occupied the same territory, but Tim, Tim's about 10 years older than me. And, uh, it was that first debate on women deacons and deaconesses mm -hmm. that brought us together. And I, I've always in like, I would rather have a debate over things that I deeply care about and disagree upon with a friend mm -hmm. rather than someone that I don't like. Yeah. And so it was a real blessing to be able to have that. So maybe that explains why he says the things he says in the, <laughs> he doesn't like us, yeah. right? He doesn't no. like us. And so no. we're not friends. All right. So what does he no. I and mean, what's he practicing here? He's practicing friend, the friend, enemy, enemy distinction. distinction. <laughs> you just let the cat out of the bag, like a Duncan. You're a Schmidian, buddy. All right. Conversation with Tim, and um, but he kind of didn't debate you, right? He he showed up, and then he was like, that, eh. "That's that's Tim's way, right? Yeah. That's Tim's way." I mean, Tim doesn't like to be polemical. Mm -hmm. You know, that was just never he did. Tim, his his posture was always apologetic and evangelistic. It he was. was always trying to make a case for the gospel. Mm -hmm. He was trying to strip away objections to the gospel and mm -hmm. to Christianity, and he was trying to reach out and persuade. And he was an evangelist at his he heart. Really was, yeah. And so he, he he was really uncomfortable in polemical settings. Yeah. Now, he had strong opinions and well founded opinions, mm -hmm. and I I actually enjoyed arguing with him in private mm -hmm. more than in public mm -hmm. because he didn't, you know, when you're in public and you're a person of his stature, every, everybody is listening for every nuance of what you say and they'll have a read on whatever you say, however you say it. Yeah. When you're in private, you don't have to be careful that way. And so, you know, I've, I've been in a room with Al Mohler, Mark Dever, 
Tim Keller and me and unbelievably candid interactions. Yeah, right. And that was super enjoyable yeah. from a debate standpoint, more enjoyable than being in a public setting. But what was, you know, just like the first time I met Vern Poitras at Westminster Seminary, unbelievably smart guy, but you meet Vern and you immediately love him. He mm -hmm. just, he loves Jesus. He mm -hmm. loves the Bible and you just love the man. Well, I, same thing with Tim. You just, you meet Tim and you just, you, you talk to him for a little bit and you just, I love this man. Yeah. I, you know, I love, I love the way he loves Christ. You know, when, when you learn his story and, and I do think Colin really helped a lot of people come mm -hmm. in. Oh, oh, that's, mm -hmm. that's, where that mm -hmm. that's where that comes from in Tim. That's where that comes from in Tim. That's where that comes from in Tim. And I, I knew a little of that because my wife went to Gordon Conwell okay. a little bit after yeah. Tim, but she had the same theological experience at Gordon Conwell that Tim and Kathy did. And so I got, I, I used to tell people, if you want to understand Tim, you have to understand Gordon Conwell, 1975. Mm -hmm. It's just everything, wh whether it's loveless on dynamics of the spiritual life or whether, you know, I can go down the list of the people. And, and of course, especially Meredith Klein, yeah. that had a huge impact on Tim. But I, you know, so it was really good to be put in that setting because I think people thought that we were going to come out, you know, with, you yeah. know, with, with guns blazing and, and uh, fisticuffs and all of that. And we had a really good, enjoyable engagement that I think was clarifying and it ended up being unifying for the denomination. And, and then, we had several other public engagements like that. But I tell you, one of the great blessings has been the last seven years, I've taught Introduction to Pastoral and Theological Studies in New York City with Tim. So next oh. week, I will teach it without Tim for the first time in oh, seven years. Wow. So it's a really poignant thing for me. And I'm actually, what, this will surprise some people on this call. Whereas Tim started when we were teaching that course, doing a lot of his cultural engagement stuff up front. He realized after the first group of students that most of our students were basically unfamiliar with Reformed Soteriology. So what Tim, he, he put all these cultural engagement stuff aside and his one agenda in his lecture hours was to convince them of Reformed Soteriology. Wow. And, um, and, it, and he also did a lot of stuff on call to ministry that was helpful too. But um, I, I, there are a lot of people out there that I think would surprise, that would surprise oh, them. You know, he set aside contextualization. City, yeah. sets aside contextualization to go after Calvinism. To make sure you understand and, grace. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's exactly right. And so that was fun to be able to see him do that yeah. and to watch how he did that and how he handled objections. And uh, I, that was one of the great privileges because I would sit in on his classes mm -hmm. and um, he, he was a master teacher. He remembered. I'm going to skip ahead the, uh, the, from the Tim Keller odes. Uh, so let's move on to classical theism here. Full for that. Uh, I, you know, I, in, in the 1970s and 80s, uh, because the, the big thing was just the battle for the Bible. So the doctrine of special revelation was a front burner issue. It was not uncommon for evangelicals to question all kinds of historic commitments to the Christian doctrine of God that Catholics, Orthodox, and Protestants would have all agreed upon up sure. until the 19th century. Sure. The 20th century, you had people jettisoning the doctrine of divine simplicity, divine impassibility, uh, immutability. I can go down the list of things that, that relatively solid evangelicals had thrown out the window. Sure. And so the, the recovery of a robust historic and biblical Christian doctrine of God call it classical theism oh, yeah, right, yeah. is, a, is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Yeah. And, um, and, and I, you know, I, I've told Scott, my, my pro, uh, president at RTS Orlando has been a big part of that. His, he's a Trinitarian theologian has written in that uh, Zondervan series, of Scott, short Swain? Scott Swain, a uh, short introduction yeah. on the Trinity. Yeah. I told Scott, you know, Scott, you, you have made me go back and think about how I've said things in my mm -hmm. doctrine of God course, yeah. you know, things that I've said for 30 years that I've wanted to try because of the insights that you have given to me, I wanted to tighten up yeah. what, what I was doing. I always had, because I was confessional, I was protected against some of the sure. new Fangled trends that were out there. Like, yeah. I know, you know, the, the uh, people that were jettisoning impassibility, I never bought that because okay. I, I knew I couldn't buy that. That's not confessional. It's not a, a, a historic Christian approach to God. But the work of these younger guys, and they're everywhere. They're in the Baptist world, they're in the Presbyterian world, yeah. they're in the Anglican right. world, conservative, Bible believing guys, recovering historic Christian doctrine, especially in the doctrine of God. Uh, they've really helped me yeah. uh, and, and I think set us on a good course. The reformers were pretty harsh on scholasticism. Um, some of the guys. I'll pause there just for a second because it's it's interesting, Chase, um, because you know you've got um, you got him. I think rightly talking about the recovery of classical theology and and uh, classical um, you know Protestant doctrine and so forth, and that's good. But what happens when you recover like classical Protestant political theology? Yeah, uh, and you base get touched. and you base these things in in the same realities that you know that that Calvin and and Turretin and Bavink and and so forth understood. Right? Oh, we can't talk about that stuff. No, 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 because that conflicts with the post war consensus. Yeah. So he's 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 anti that. Right? Nope, we can't go there. But on all everything else, on the doctrine of God, on impassibility, mutability, and so forth. Right, that's cool. That's good, and, and and of course he's right. Like in the, he recognizes a lot of stuff really changed in the 20th century. Isn't that weird? Right, all all these things came under attack. All these realities that everybody recognized across the board throughout Christendom. Right, 
Protestant, Catholic, Eastern. Everybody agreed on this until the 20th century, and then, woo, now they don't. Does that apply to anything else, Dr. Duncan? <laughs> right? Does that apply to anything else besides the doctor of God? Right? Yeah, no? and here's, here's what's weird is that, you know, like, we could debate that doctrine of God stuff. I, you know, I can have a good time doing that. Some of them are, are huge nerds, and I can't keep up. But besides <laughs> the point, the, what do you said in there about the debate? He's coming out and he's talking about the debates and the conversations they're going to have with Dever, Moeller, and they're in private. They're willing to have the conversations, yeah. but in public, it's a perception game. These are very politically minded people, and that's yeah. that's again fine, fine, yeah. be that way. But like to then accuse other people of being co-opted by politics or thinking yeah. worldly, like that is a that is a way that people behave. There, are, of course, there are private conversations you're going to have in public conversations. But my biggest complaint with the generation, I mean, he's the CEO, chancellor of RTS, the president of RTS, Jackson. And it's like, dude, like, just be honest, publicly be honest, like publicly be honest about your convictions instead of trying to play this game that you've been playing, that it's you're losing, you're losing bigly. And, and it's just funny because with all this power and institutional credibility, He's going to say, uh, you know, I don't even pay attention to these other people. I don't even pay attention to them. And he's going to focus so much attention, though, talking about it. So there's a there's a duplicity of political yeah. don't maneuvering pay attention going to on them, here. But they're dangerous and don't listen to them. Right. Uh, <laughs> it's wild. Yeah, no, it's it's crazy, man. Like, uh, yeah, like this is this is it. We must spend all our resources defining infralapsarianism. Ignore <laughs> the drag queen story hours. Like, that's, that's just it. Like, it's it. those are safe and comfortable things. Right. No one, no one is going to drive you out of your positions, right? You're not going to get fired as the chancellor of this university or this seminary because of your, you know, because you're spending all your time focusing on, on, you know, essentially arcane theological stuff, right? No, right. no, that nobody's going to care. Exactly. All right. Let's, let's dig back in. In this classical theism conversation, are more friendly yeah. towards scholasticism. Yeah. Do you think that's just because of how kind of uh, scarred, wounded <laughs> the reformers were because of the the way scholasticism had run amok that's in the Roman good. Catholic Church? Uh, it, you know, you, you will you will find a mixed report in the reformers on the scholastics, and it depends on which scholastic you're talking about. True. So, you know, Luther for sure was completely fried with late medieval nominalism. And look, I would have been too. I'd, right. I'd have been over in the corner cheering, "Go Luther, go!" Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the late medieval nominalists come in for a lot of pounding from both the Lutheran and the Reformed. That's still going on today. But there, there are also scholastic theologians uh, who the, 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 the Reformers, the first generation Reformers quoted with approbation. And, uh, and, and so you know, Calvin was not trained in a classical theological curriculum. He was a humanist trained. I mean, his, his, his dissertation was on Seneca's uh, thesis on clemency. Mm -hmm. uh, he, had, he had been prepared for law and then went in a different direction. Mm -hmm. He, he, he does not in the way that a uh, Petrus van Maastricht or a, or a uh, Francis Turretin or someone like that cite the scholastics and such. But you, you can find an, you can find Calvin citing scholastic opinion in an approving way and then slapping around the schoolmen in yeah, other areas. Yeah. And you can find a little bit of that in just about all of okay. uh, the reformers. So it, it was it was not a not necessarily a wholesale rejection of everything. I remember R.C. Sproul, I, I was doing this conference on the Westminster Confession before PCA General Assemblies back in the 1990s, early 2000s. And I invited R.C. to give a lecture on the Westminster Doctrine of God. And he, he got up and he, his first sentence was something like this. There is nothing unique about the doctrine of God in magisterial reformed Protestantism in the 16th century in relation to Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. Mm. But the most unique thing about magisterial Protestantism in the 16th century was its doctrine of God. And that was such an okay. RC way to start a okay. lecture. Yeah. And then he, he went on to argue that what, what the reformers had done is that they had worked out the doctrine of God in relation to all the other loci of theology. Okay. So that the sovereignty of God permeated the totality of your theology, not just this little area of the doctrine of God and the Trinity. Mm. And of course, that, that especially applies to soteriology. Wow. You know? and, um, but it also applied to things like ecclesiology. And so uh, in, in an interesting way, RC kind of anticipated what has happened in the last five, 10 years yeah. amongst all these young guys. Fascinating. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I did not know that I learned from Colin Hansen's biography of Keller was the connection of Keller and RC. Yes. At, uh, what was the name of the place where they were? Uh, the Ligonier. The Ligonier, uh, the original Ligonier yeah, Study yeah, Center. Yeah, yeah, before yeah. it was in Florida. Yeah. yeah. Uh, brother, this is not meant to be like a, a clickbaity kind of, ooh, for the views question, but so, so just so you know what's coming. I, I genuinely... <laughs> yeah, right. I <laughs> only want to know because I, when I think, what do I want the young men in my church 
to be like, how, what are we discipling them towards? And I'm not flattering you. That's a sin. I think Love Ligon Duncan doesn't move an inch on the gospel, mm. right? Doesn't move an inch on cultural things. Now, I know some people have disagreed with certain decisions sure. statements you've made. That's true of all of us. Sure. But also incredibly gracious, incredibly Catholic. Even in this interview, the way you've spoken about brothers and sisters with whom you have uh, minor to significant disagreements with. I'm like, that's what I want for our guys uh, and our gals. Uh, yeah. well, thoughts on the Moscow mood conversation? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, think, I really loaded that. I think, that Kevin, up, I think yeah. Kevin did a, a, a service to us writing on that. I think Kevin realized that he was going to take a lot of incoming uh, on that. He, he told me probably a month or two before he was ready to, to release that. that he well, was he brought it up at ETS, right? And, and, like... <laughs> uh, and gave me sort of an early uh, draft uh, of it. I think that's a good warning to send right now. All right, number one, before we, we're really going to break this down, but number one, right, like you said, Chase, right, all this stuff, and it, of course, this is the way it works, right? Yep. They workshop this stuff in private. They, Yep. Yeah, you know, this goes through like all these guys. It's a big club, and you're not in it. And they're talking about what's Kevin DeYoung going to say? Like, what's yeah. he going to say about Moscow? Right? Ooh, let's 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 figure this out. Like they're doing it in private, which again, yeah. right? Private conversations that that's fine. Right? Everybody has private conversations, and they 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 think through things with their friends. But right, they like to pretend that they're not doing that. Exactly. Right. They like to pretend, oh, we're so above it all. We don't do these things. And what are they doing? Right. Ex exactly that. Right. They're, they're doing politics in the church. They're, what they're doing. They're getting on their AOL account and they're emailing each other on their listserv, you know, no, saying, oh, no. I'm gonna, I got to We got to deal with this problem, guys. How, who's going to deal with it? Oh, Kevin. Kevin's the guy. Okay, we'll Kevin, send out a draft. We're going to coordinate. We're all going to praise it publicly. And uh, that'll really put a stop to this nonsense that we're hearing. From these people that are really causing us trouble, but they're not that big anyway. So why are we paying attention to them? But we need to release and coordinate a huge effort to release an article to just dump on everything they're doing. Uh, so yeah, it's just there is no man behind the curtain, and yeah, no, no, never, <laughs> never, never at all. Oh, 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 don't lose it. I think there there are some people in our culture uh, today who are saying that here, this is the model of faithfulness: lob grenades. And, um, and, and I think, I, I think it's really good for guys like Kevin who himself, Kevin's got back, right, Kevin right, is willing right. to speak into things that he knows are going to get people yep. upset. He's about. down for the fight. He's, he's down for it. Uh, Kevin Young. So when I think of courage and backbone, man, I think of Kevin DeYoung, right? Is that who you think of too, uh, Chase? You know, I think of, I think of an academic. That's who I think of. And I think these guys are just academics, man. And I was, I was like, I was I was looking at you know they are respectful they have institutional mm -hmm. credibility men yep. no wonder they have eleven thousand people at their conference men are drawn towards institutional credibility respectability absolutely uh, Kevin I haven't read that much of Kevin I'm sure he's a nice guy uh, which might be the problem also but like yeah I don't I didn't see him where has he been you know what's he's been holding the the line on certain doctrinal matters certainly and yet no I don't. I haven't seen him like uh, try to. He's he he was part of the Gospel Coalition. I think he left it, but of course that was all hush hush. You know we're yeah. not going to cause a stink. And it's nope. like no one wants no one wants to stir the pot. No one wants to fight these guys. That's what's ironic. They talk about how they're willing to fight. They're willing to have the conversation. All that kind of stuff. No, you're not. No, you're no. not. Yeah. You, what did what did, what what did they do in 2020? Right. Yeah. What? Where was Kevin <laughs> Young saying this is wrong? They should be closing down churches. Open them up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What? There are, are massive race riots happening throughout our country, right? That are obviously coordinated, right? Yep. Oh, we're going to bend over backwards to appease these people and say that yep. their, their grievances have credibility, right? Where was the courage then, right? Where did you take that institutional power, right? All, all this power you have and wield it for the sake of your people. Didn't right. do it, right? Didn't do it. No. Some backbone. Let's keep going. But th that doesn't mean that you are the most faithful when you are lobbying the most grenades indiscriminately in every direction. Right, yeah. And when you are doing clickbaity stuff on, you know, it's, it's one thing to, to LARP faithfulness and courage on social media. It's another. It's one thing to LARP faithfulness and courage on social media. Right. One thing. Yeah. Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> please, Legan, please LARP. Please just LARP a little. I'm begging a you. Little LARP. <laughs> Just a tiny bit. Like throw a grenade. Like he this interview is him throwing a grenade. Right? He's lobbing yeah. a grenade indiscriminately at us, at our people. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like that he's willing to throw grenades. He's willing to lob those things out there and LARP with his faithfulness. Ooh, we're the Bible people. 
Yeah. Who, who's it directed at? Right. He's, yeah. he's not going out there and saying like our country is being taken over by insane Marxists. Right. Yep. Not saying that. No, no, not saying that at all. Right. Because that's actually happening and that might cost you something to do that. Right. Right. right? It's very safe to say these things. Right. Yes. I expect him to say these things. So, yeah, keep lobbing those grenades, man. Other thing to do it in real life. And um, and, and I, you've got a lot of live action role playing going on. In, 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 let's 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 take up the distinction between real life. I keep I keep uh, I'm pausing them a lot, but we're going to pick this thing apart. Um, and I and I know you got to get going here in a little bit here, Chase. But um, this is where the meat is of, of the thing. Right. These are real life people like you're, you're a pastor of real life people who have to you know, work at a job and they are they're they're constantly on pins and needles over what they can say and what they can do. Right. What they Absolutely. can believe publicly. And they're always under attack. Right. The HR ladies right around the corner. You might get fired maybe because you go to Chase Davis's church. Right. Is, this is real life. Man, this, this is all real life. We're all dealing with this real life stuff. All the people watching this, right? We got, you know, a thousand people watching in the live here, right? These are all real life people that are dealing with real life things that are, and they're, they're largely sheep without shepherds. I don't know if you, you get, you know, all, all the same emails I do, but I get, I get a lot of emails from people and I, I feel bad if you're listening out there, if you emailed me, I haven't replied. I'm, I'll get to you. Don't worry. I, I'm trying to keep up with everything, but they're like, where do I go? Where do I go to a church totally. that's gonna that 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 thinks like I do that the that they're not gonna call me an evil, horrible, bigoted person and and just toss me out, right? There are people that that they're dealing with this real life stuff and they're looking for courage. And where do they find it? Well, they find it, you know, they find it because people are saying things that are true and costly online, right? It isn't just yeah. it isn't just digital larping, right? These yeah, are and I think people. that's you look at what Elon is willing to post. You know, and it, and that's uh, the the prophets of God are being shamed by the prophets of the world. You know, yeah. like he's willing to yeah. say this stuff out loud. No one's calling him a larper because he's willing to say this stuff out loud. He's building rockets. You know, he's he's yeah. doing stuff. And so this assumption, it's just funny. They all found this word larp. You know, they yeah. they yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. they're they're very you know hive mind. You know, uh, we're gonna call them larpers. That's gonna get them. It's like that that'll work. Say, like I don't know. <laughs> you think that's gonna stick? Like that? No, like. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to be a larper. I'm going to larp for Jesus. I'm going to try to be like him every day. I'm going to pretend to be like, more like Christ every day in every yeah. aspect of my life with how I raise my kids, how I pastor. And you've got people in churches who are going to force DEI trainings who aren't allowed to have Christian organizations at their companies who are thinking about leaving their workplace because they hear things like why people are evil. Uh, they, I've heard I've heard uh, church members talk about how at corporate presentations they've said F Jesus Christ. These are real people dealing with real things. And the idea that that you know we're just on here LARPing or people aren't here LARPing, what they mean is they're fake. It's like it's not fake, yeah. dude. Like this is real stuff. You know, the people who are fake are the ones that are sitting in this you know chancellor position and and not actually engaging people with the real struggles they're facing economically, socially, culturally, politically, and they're not willing to pull from their own religious heritage. They're to engage the real questions of today with how do we deal? That was the thing I did in, during COVID, man. It's like when the world is going crazy, I was like, well, surely, surely we're not the first people that have dealt with this. So what I do, I go back to Calvin. I go, what do they do during the Black Death? Like you're talking about, you want to talk about fatalities, <laughs> lots of fatalities. How did they deal with it? Okay, well, that's actually really helpful because what I'm getting from, from Big Eva, from guys like Legan or whoever else is like, well, just don't offend and don't upset and keep the status mm -hmm. quo. The status quo is gone, man. It's gone. Yeah. Uh, and and, and you got to be able to get out there and say something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, this one from, you know, Forge and Anvil, right? It's fake that parents in Indiana have had their child removed for not affirming their new gender, right? And that the United States Supreme Court, oh, we love the Constitution. The United States Supreme Court decided not to take up the case, right? That that stuff's fake, right? That that's stuff that people care about. I mean, the fact that there are, you know, since Joe Biden took office, 8 million illegal immigrants with the official numbers, right? Just roaming around the country. The fact that in, in Indiana, or sorry, Illinois, where it's like, you, you've got to pass, you've got to have like two different permits just to be able to own a handgun, right? And if you get caught with one without one of those permits, you're going to jail for a long time. Well, guess what they just did in Illinois today? They, they, they caught an, an illegal with one and 
they, they drop the charges. No big deal. Right. They have a right. They have a Second Amendment right. Right. People who are not citizens of here, not even here legally. They have a Second Amendment. Right. Like this is all stuff people care about. Is Lincoln Duncan ever going to talk about mass migration and demographic change? He will, but positively. He'll say, oh, this is good. Yeah. There's more people to share Only the gospel positively. with. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. that's what he'll say. Never, never once talk, take up like the single biggest political issue in America today, which is which is immigration. They won't right. touch that with a 10 million foot pole, right? At no. all. They're terrified of talking about that stuff. Is it is it LARPy that I talk about that? Right? No, it's not because real people, my people care about this stuff and are threatened by these things. And, and so to say, Oh, this is just, this is just LARPy, man. This is just fake. You're just a bomb thrower, right? Is it, it's absurd. So let's let him say more absurd stuff on in the social media world from guys acting like they're tough that put them in a room and you'd have them in a fetal position in yeah. three seconds. Yeah, that's right. And uh, yeah, let's, let's test that theory out. Ligon Duncan. Let's test that. I'll, I'll join you in any room you want. You can put me in the fetal position if you want, right? Come <laughs> dress me down, you chew me out, right? I'm not the PCA. You can't bully me, right? Do whatever, do whatever you want. You know, use your mumbo jumbo all you want, man. <laughs> I don't care. I don't care. Like, I mean, this is, yeah. this is the thing. I mean, I've, I've said this for, for many years about, about these eggheads is yeah. you could tell in like, like five minutes if one of these guys has ever been punched in the face before. Right, you could tell. Yeah. Right, you could tell. Like, is this a man who has been in literal fisticuffs? Right, had their nose right. bloodied every once in their life, and they haven't. They haven't. Yeah, talk about talking tough. Oh, we'll get you in the fetal position. Right, we'll get you in the Wild. fetal position. Like, come on, man. Right, could you could you imagine that? Could you imagine him? You know, I, I, I yeah, Lincoln Duckett, please, please, I'll, wherever you want to meet, man, I'll go. I'll go. We could televise it. You can you can embarrass me, right? I'm I'm a theological peasant compared to you. You can make me sound like an idiot. I don't care. But whenever you name the time and place, you got my email. Let's go. Right? Put me in the feudal position. I'd love it. All right. Let's let him keep going. Uh, and that it's not good for that voice to influence our our young folks. We are going to have to. Yeah, it's that. not good. It's not good for people that want to fight to influence our young people. Right. Just lay down and die, young people. Right. Just just go to your gospel centered enclave and pretend it didn't happen. And right. That's the kind of people we want influencing them. Bone. But we're also going to have to cultivate uh, a love for the world that hates us. I, Bill Davis, who teaches at uh, at uh, Covenant College, says that the most common student the question that he gets from his philosophy students is, Dr. Davis, teach me how to love a world that hates me. And, that, mm. you know, so I, I want them, I don't want them to get any of their signals from the world. I want them to get all their signals from the Bible. I want them to faith, be faithful to the whole panoply of Christian doctrine. But I want them thinking, how can I reach out to this lost world? How can I love people that hate me? Not how can I make them hate me more? Uh, how can I demoralize and demean them with every word that I say? How can I? All right. I got, I, I can't even let him finish. I can't even, I can't <laughs> even, I can't do it. I got to I got to I got to say something. Right. These people hate you. I mean, just think, I mean, think if you're living in the Soviet Union during the Bolshevik revolution, right? And they unleash mobs of criminals to come, you know, kill and rape and steal anything and everything. And with the first question you'd be, you'd be asking is, man, how can I love these people that hate me? Right? How can I, right. how can I just love them? I just got to love them. Right. The first question you should be asking is how do we stop this? Right. How do we? How do we protect my neighbors who are being killed and destroyed? Right? right. How do I pro how do I protect my people? Right. And and this is this is constantly. I mean, CJ and I talk about this all the time. Uh, this category error that they have of a friend enemy distinction that that love for that enemy love in the Bible is interpersonal. Right. It's people yep. that are like that are, are your neighbors that are around you that are they're doing harm to you. Yeah, you need to you need to lay down your life for them. You need to love them. You go the second mile. You turn the other cheek. All of those things. When we're talking about the political, right? We're talking about a people that are being destroyed, right? That that category doesn't work, right? Jesus is not a pacifist. He's not, right? right. Take up the sword, right? For those who have him, like he's he's a king who wields a sword, and right. right if you have, right if if you have you know legitimate political institutions fighting your enemies, preventing these things from happening, you need to support them, right? You yeah. need to, you need to build those things up, 
right? It's not, and again, I'm not talking about vigilantism and things like that, just so if people want to clip this and, and attack. Right. No, I'm talking about legitimate political authority using political power to protect its people. That that's that's what it's instituted for. That's the whole point of it. And so yeah. is he gonna say to to Caesar, like, no, no, you need to love your enemies, man. You can't, you gotta you just gotta let the rapists go free and to keep doing their thing. Right? No, of course not. Right? This is it's insane. It's insane. How do I how do I love the well, I don't know, man. Like if if insane communists are are coming, you know, burning down your door, right? The question is how do I how do I love these people or how do we how do we fight them? Right. That's the question before us. And he doesn't want to he doesn't even want to approach that at all. No, there's no distinguishing. There's no categories uh, that are allowed to distinguish between how we understand Jesus's command to love our enemies, how we do that well. Well, first, we preach yeah. the gospel naturally, that the gospel that kills and makes alive. And also there's no category for, like you said, political or cultural matters. It's, it's simply a flat reading a marginalization, a narrative of decline where we're not allowed or permitted to even, th you know, think about how he framed it. It's either you're lobbing grenades um, and, uh, and or you're making the world hate you more. And it's like, no, you're missing the point entirely. Because, yeah. And this is what he did all throughout COVID or BLM or all this other stuff, where the framing of how we present the biblical truth is always in service and a subservient uh, way. So as not to offend certain people, they're willing mm -hmm. to offend others, but they're not willing to offend the left. And so I, I, yeah. I, I can't stand it because he's willing to lock grenades. He won't, but he won't even be honest about his rules of engagement. And, no. and that's the thing you want to, okay, fine. You don't like Isker's Boniface option. Fine. Let <laughs> Isker do his thing and no. let's see how it goes for him. And then yeah. you do your thing and let's see the fruit at the end. Maybe Isker's going to have to deal with a bunch of angry young dudes and he's going to have to disciple them and, you know, say, like, oh, no, 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 you know, <laughs> say we're not to a vigilant, you know, he's going to have to provide. But yeah. you're not even willing to give space for contextualization. You're not even willing to, to think outside the box, your own elite academic egghead box, where uh, there might be other options besides your kind of neutered, uh, you know, female professor at Furman, motherly instinct way of engaging in the ivory tower. Yeah, that's what it is. That's what it is. All right, let's let's let Lee and I drive them away again. from the gospel for the sake of branding and building my own and tribe. even wound my brothers and sisters correct, on the way. Correct. Yeah, and so that's rich. <laughs> wound my brothers and sisters. Drive people away from the. Think about the people that Ligon Duncan and people like him are driving away from the gospel. Right, right now there are tens of millions of people. They'll call them cultists that that support Donald Trump. That they want nothing to do with whatsoever. They think they're dirty, filthy people that we got to keep out of the church, right? The deplorables. Yeah, we don't want those people in our churches, right? We don't want people like that. And I'm like, I do. I want those people. Those are our people. Those are people you could that that are desperate for something, right? They're yes. desperate for a king named Jesus to fix things, right? I yes. want I want those people to have that. Right. Yes. Who, who's more likely to come to Christ, Ligon Duncan, right? The the mega hat wearing, you know, roofer or, you know, driving the F-150 with the Trump flag on it or, you know, the obese, you know, 300 pound androgynous, you know, purple haired, you know, septum pierced freak. Right. right. Which which one that that's screaming at you about trans rights. Right. Which one right. is going to listen to you talk about the gospel? Which one's more likely? Right. 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 Um, that that's that's like my my you know standard operating procedure is pretty obvious which one is which. Right. And the and the one side, yeah, the the middle American radical, right? The MAGA people, do they do they have problems? Yeah, of course they do. Right. There's also you read like JD Vance's book about you know yes. hillbilly elegy, right? Yes. Are there problems there? Absolutely, there's problems there. There are problems there that the gospel fixes. Yes. The problems that exist in urban areas and in in mainstream American culture and on the left, right? The way the gospel fixes that is it tells them, no, you can't do this stuff anymore, right? That's how the Correct. gospel fixes that. It isn't like, oh, they all radically decide, oh, you know, this way I'm living, this, this thing I hate, which is at the core is Christianity, they hate, right? You're not going to persuade them in this Tim Kellery way to all of a no. sudden become a Christian, right? That's no. but but. Those are the safe people to engage. 
right? You're fine <laughs> engaging those people. I think that's, I really appreciate Kevin being willing to wade into that. And I think underneath that is it's, it's not only a mood there, there's a, there's a theological view of the, of the church, of the gospel, of fidelity, and there are problems at each of those levels underneath that. I'm about to ask you about big Eva, but because you are one of the patriarchs of it, I don't expect an honest <laughs> answer from you, but let's just, let's just play this game. Okay. <laughs> Setting a low bar for me. There. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, what do you think when people talk about this shadowy syndicate, this yeah. big machine of Big Eva? Um, he, he, uh, most of the conversation that I hear about Big Eva is complete nonsense. Uh, and it, it is funny, mm. some of the some of the biggest critics of Big Eva, if there is a Big Eva, they're it. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I could name organizations far larger and more extensive than the Gospel Coalition, for instance. Yeah, the boy, do they hate the Gospel Coalition. That hate the Gospel Coalition. Yeah. And, and they've got more money, mm -hmm. they've got more reach, they've got more, you know, all, and, 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 and they'll jump in on the Big Eva conversation. So a lot of it is just nonsense, and I pay no attention to it whatsoever. Now, which is why you're on this podcast talking about it, Lincoln Duncan. You pay yeah. no attention to it. Yeah. Pay yeah. no attention. And yeah. No, I don't care. But let me talk for like 10 minutes about why they're wrong. <laughs> he just described all the Big Eva aspects leading up to this. And then like it, it was Carl Truman, I think, who, who kind of coined the term. Like you've got Crossway. You've got the publishers, the Christian colleges and, and these, these big names like all Lincoln. These yeah. Wow. Pushing their books um, with podcast uh, galore. And, uh, you know, such that, like, my, my parents asked me about these podcasts and, oh, did you hear about this? And I have to, like, help explain, like, this yeah. is all part of the, the machine. And my parents, oh, that makes sense. Because this is the human nature. This is the way people yeah. organize. It's the way people get things done. And the, the flat out denial that exists is baffling. It's yeah. like, it's, uh, it's he just, insane. He just talked about how, yeah, we had we all sat down and talked to Kevin about this at ETS. And we read over his draft and all this kind of stuff. But no, Big Eva mm, doesn't exist. It does not exist. No, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Um, you know, have have there have, have have people been disappointed by leaders unwilling to take stands on important things? Sure, I'm sure that's happened. Yeah. You know, welcome to the fallen world. Uh, and I, I want us to be people of principle, and sometimes that means calling out people that we love and care about. But you can you can do that in such a way that is not. We have a culture in in a, in a part of evangelical right evangelicalism right now that is desensitized to its own spirit of mocking and slander. Mm -hmm. And that's, that kind of goes back to the Moscow move thing again. So. Mocking and slander is not a Christian way of dealing with anything. Mm -hmm. And so. Lincoln Duncan, have you ever read the Gospels? Have you ever <laughs> you ever read them before? You ever read like you know maybe you have one of those Bibles with you know the letters in red, and a lot of those letters in red is Jesus mocking his enemies constantly. Yeah. You ever you ever read the the prophets right the you know Isaiah and Jeremiah Ezekiel right? There is a whole lot of mocking that takes place yeah. in the Bible, and and a lot of it almost all of it, actually the vast majority of it is mocking the established religious figures. Yeah. Mocking. The Bible's full of mocking. <laughs> right? you, can't, of you, you can't turn a page on the Bible without finding some mocking going on. Yes. And so yep. mocking is a Christian virtue, right? Why? Because Jesus did it, right? Jesus did it, man. Like, what are you on about here that we can't mock people who are doing evil things, especially when they're in high positions of leadership and they're right. failing so badly and they're, and, and they're failing on purpose, right? All the stuff that they do, there's a purpose to it. It's to appease the left. It's to appease yep. the people that are destroying our world. Yep. And so, yeah, we're going to mock them. We're going to mock this stuff, right? When, when Lincoln Duncan says that, you know, systemic racism is a problem, I'm going to mock that. Absolutely, I'm yeah. gonna mock that, make fun of that, make memes about it. Absolutely, man. <laughs> like, what? What is wrong with you, man? Read the Bible, right? Read it. <laughs> Just read the Bible. That's 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 all I got to say about that. So, you know, many of those mockers and, and slanderers, I have no reason to even think they're Christians. Can I pause yeah. you out there? Well, because I know somebody from that world will hear you say that and go, "This guy doesn't know his Bible." What about? It's <laughs> <laughs> <Dude, Andrew. laughs> Guilty. Guilty as charged. <laughs> the prophets. What about Jesus? Look at the way Paul talks. How would you respond to that? Well, I mean, one thing is Jesus was neither a mocker nor a slanderer. Ooh, okay. So uh, when, 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 and, and if you, by the way, if, if, if some of these folks had been around, 
they would have been going, yay, John the Baptist, Jesus, you're a weasel. Mm, John is preaching truth to power. Why don't you come out and say, why don't you go up to, and say, Herod, you fox? Mm. You know, why, why don't you be like John? And I think one of the things the Bible teaches you. Wait, 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 wait a minute here. Wait just a second. Is he saying that Jesus was like opposed to John <laughs> condemning yeah. Herod? What? I think, uh, I think underneath that is an assumption that uh, John, Jesus would have read that. Yeah, he's putting it in a, a post, even though Jesus said no greater man has been born among women uh, than John the Baptist. So it, this this reading of scripture is just, it's fascinating. He, he marries mocking and slanders if they're the same, first yep. of all. A category, or again, we cannot have categories, we cannot distinguish. Mm-mm. And then secondly, he can't even acknowledge that Jesus mocked people. It's like, yeah. It's insane to me uh, how they're so captured by winsomeness. They're so captured yeah. by yeah. this mode, uh, this academic captivity, where the only way to have a discussion is good faith, you know, believing the best about other people. And, and never should we mock them or point out error or call them names, which Jesus did all the time. It's just, it's wild. Yeah, Jesus wasn't a mocker, but here he's mocking people constantly. And he mocks him so much, they killed him. <laughs> this is unbelievable like this is this is the best you got big eva this is it right here this is this is your top guy and this is how he thinks this is nuts is there different ways to be faithful you know if, if, if some of these people had been around they would have been on daniel like white on rice you're a sellout mm-hmm. you you work for the wickedest king in the world mm-hmm. you are facilitating his wickedness and his ungodly rule. Yeah, Daniel is a high-ranking official in a pagan empire with extensive influence in how the, the empire works. So it, it, in the Bible, you find believers in very different circumstances dealing differently. Yeah, so this is this is like, uh, oh, uh, Francis Collins is actually a good guy. He's like Daniel, man. You can't say anything yeah, bad about right. him. You know, you, yeah. you know, he's in a high position of power, and, and he's just like Daniel. And, man, Daniel was willing to die for for his faith. Right. And Daniel's companions willing to die for their faith. But no, no, that Francis Collins is just like just like Daniel, man. You can't you can't disparage him in any way. No, 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 no. We can't be doing that. Right. This, this it's nuts. I think about think about high ranking officials that he would disparage. Right. We we've got a friend named William Wolf who worked yep. in the Trump White House. And what I wonder what the Lincoln Duncan thinks about William Wolf. Yeah, right. We right. disparage him and say, "Oh, you're working for this evil man, Donald Trump. You're working for him. How dare you, you weasel!" Right? That's what he would say about this. I mean, I, I think totally. I can impute that to him. I don't think I don't think it's unfair to say that, right? No, I think that's that's totally true. And I, Russ Vaught, uh, William Wolf, I, you know, he's talking about America is an empire. America is this with massive reach, massive influence, and so, in, in principle, of course, we agree that this is possible. We're, we're simply calling balls and strikes the best we can, according to the Bible. And Francis Collin compromised left or right on LGBTQ abortion. I mean, for God's sakes, he was he was uh, allowing the NIH to buy aborted fetuses uh, to graft their skin onto animals. I mean, this is a, a man who wasn't just participating in the empire. He was he was actively funding research of, of uh, unspeakable depravity. And so they're they're constantly going to celebrate this guy, Francis Collins, whoever it is that he's just thinking like about. Daniel. That's just like yeah, just like that. and they're gonna they're gonna never give the time of day never even give the benefit of the doubt never gonna have a good faith conversation no. with somebody who might do something different so yeah no wild. never have never have a good faith conversation no 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 not with not with us we're because we're not friends we're enemies now, you know is, is Daniel willing to go to the lion's den rather than stop praying to his God yeah but he's still working for the government. You know, and there's some people who call you out today yeah. for, for that. So I, I, I think that it, let, let's actually look at the Bible and how the Bible teaches Christians to deal with culture. I, 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 I invented a course for RTS called Christ, Culture, and Contextualization. It's a systematic theology course because I saw so many students going out and thinking about contextualization for the first time in their lives, not in the context of theological education, but on, on the field yeah. and doing a really bad job of thinking about contextualization. All right. If you went to RTS and took that course, you may be entitled to compensation. <laughs> ask for a refund <laughs> i hope you kept the receipt man i hope you kept that receipt because this, this is the content you're getting in that course it wasn't worth 15 grand let me tell you it wasn't worth uh anything 
Some of them given away to store in compromise. Some of them come up with bad ideas. So I, I wanted students to think about contextualization under the watchful eye of a systematic theologian wow. and read the best stuff on that. Because yeah. Max Stiles years ago convinced me that a lot of what has happened on the mission field in evangelicalism is driven by a bad ecclesiology of the local church and bad, bad contextualization. Hmm. And um, so I, I had to teach that course for the first time this year. I, I, I forced it on my entire curriculum. And uh, so one of the things I, I did is I, I said, I wonder what key passages I ought to go to. Uh, to to look at these things, and you know, the, the, you know, obviously Genesis one and two is a place that you're going to go. Um, obviously Matthew five and the Sermon on the Mount is a place, salt and light, that, that you're going to go. But what I was struck by is how much instruction there is, not just in the Minor Prophets, not just in Genesis, uh, not just in Jesus teaching the Sermon on the Mount, but all throughout the New Testament, exactly telling Christians how to go about engaging with the culture around them. Like the, the Titus two and three, it's got all kinds of stuff about how you're supposed to engage with your culture, what attitude you're supposed to have towards the lost people around you and, and brothers and sisters and neighbors and even all of that. Even false teachers, correct and your opponents with teachers. gentleness. Exactly. Yeah. And so I just started working through those, those passages with, with students. And that's what we need to disciple. We need to disciple people with the biblical way of engagement. And it's... Let's just hold up there for one second. So... Right. He goes to Titus and the you know pastoral epistles and so forth. Right. Maybe the context, we're going to talk about contextualization, right? Maybe the context of right, being is this tiny minority in the great world empire is just a little bit different than a country that at one time was was Christian everywhere. Right. Christian, the Christian religion was the fundamental principle that guided all, all of our morality, all of our law, everything else. And that's declined, right? Maybe that's a different context, right? Maybe that's a little bit different and you, you could be a little assertive in a different way, right? Maybe, maybe the context is much more like Israel during the time of the Kings. And that's, a, that's a different tack to take. You have to be much more prophetic. You have to denounce the evil things and the decline and the false worship and everything else that, that takes place. And you got to be a bomb thrower in that context. Right. But he, but like you said, Chase, right. What does he want? Right. He wants us to be this tiny little minority in this great world empire that has no power at all. Cause power is bad. Power is very bad. And we, we have, that's, that's our lot in life. We have to be this tiny little thing. And, and maybe, maybe that's where we'll be. Like he brings up the example of China or the other guy brought up, you know, these pastors in India. And it's like, that's true, right? That's, that's, that context fits a lot more to the church in the first century, but maybe we're in a different one. Right. Did you ever think yeah. of that? Maybe we don't want that. Maybe we shouldn't want that. And I, I think know. this is where a lot of these guys misfires. They're not even able to uh, reconsider their priors and assumptions no. about the history and the scope of redemption, God's plan for the world, where things are going. Uh, and you don't even have to get eschatological, eschatological on it. You can just like think, well, if you were to go to, if, if you were to imagine that America would become China, should we want that? Should we aspire to live yeah. in house churches? No. And if, if not, then maybe, maybe in Christian history and biblical, the biblical narrative, maybe we could find examples that would be educational for us rather than what he's giving up. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're sending a fly to attack you. Uh, yeah. This one for Bob, this is, I didn't even notice this. Uh, yeah. Why don't you come up and say Herod, you Fox, right? Jesus did say that in Luke 13, 32, oh. right? Yeah. He misattributed yeah, Jesus's just, insult to John the Baptist. Yeah. Yikes, thank you, Bob. Bro. yeah. The yeah. Chancellor and CEO and president of RTS Jackson. People yeah. making mistakes, okay? But look, that's that's crazy. That's super yeah. revealing. That is something like, yeah, Jesus did address culture, didn't he? Oh, whoa, ed politics. Whoa, whoa, whoa. that's a game changer. All right, uh, let's let's keep going. Here. Not always the same way. You need sometimes you need a good cop, and sometimes you need a bad cop. Yeah. And in some cases, John the Baptist was the bad bad cop, and Jesus was not the bad cop. Mm -hmm. Now, there's certainly things that Jesus said that were very in your face and very uh, direct, and they were often directed towards religious leaders who ought to have known better. Yeah. Uh, oh, who is that in this analogy? I don't know. Uh, uh, but when, when you decide to do that, you have to be very confident of your spiritual maturity. Yeah. And I see a lot of incredibly spiritually immature people, like people that I would not allow to disciple my cat <laughs> trying to do that. Okay. <laughs> and, and it's interesting what he views as spiritual maturity and what all these guys, when they talk about maturity, right? What maturity is, is you got to be an egghead, right? You got to be an egghead that only cares about otherworldly things all day long, 
you got to be thinking about theology all day and and how pious I can be and all of these and, and make sure your language is always dressed up in this in this you know this facade of piety no matter what you do and that's that that that's like the whole interview is and this is what these guys do they always talk in very pious language right always talk like the elder statesmen of of evangelicalism and so they'll say you know a guy like me or you or 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 any any of our other friends we are immature right they'll look at how young we are um and they'll say these guys are immature right i wouldn't let them disciple my cat well guess what um you've been discipling a lot of things for a long time here league duncan and look at how things are going right uh i i don't know man like i don't know if i'd let you disciple my cat you know because <laughs> all of a sudden my cat is going to going to be purple and have piercings totally. on it right oh, like like that's that's where we're at like maybe 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 we need a whole lot more of what you call immaturity and yeah. your maturity needs to go out the window right maybe yeah. less of the maturity it's like oh just it's okay things aren't that bad you know it's it's fine right that is um you know that that is always um that's always the the worst thing i know yeah i know chase you got to get rolling in like five minutes so let's let's try to wrap this here and so, you know, people, I want to go, like, do you know yourself at all? I mean, yeah. do you have any self-awareness yeah. whatsoever? Do you know what you're like? You know, would yeah. anybody in the world go to you, you know, yeah. and, and want to understand the gospel and Christianity? Yeah. And But you're going to be the arbiter of who's faithful and who's yeah. not faithful. And so social media has encouraged yeah. us in that direction because anybody with a cell phone can opine to the entire known universe. And uh, and and so when, you know, I, I really, by the way, I think that Neil Postman's book, Amusing, Amusing Ourselves, Ourselves to Death, fantastic. explains all of this. Yeah. Now, the illustrations are out of date. They'll yeah. laugh at them, yeah. et cetera. But he explains this whole dynamic 40 years ago. And uh, it, when your vision for faithfulness and engagement is a food fight, you know, whether it's on television or whether it's on Twitter uh, or X, um, then you're going to have a very different view of what it means to be faithful in relation to your culture. And a lot of it is just feeding ego and a lot of it's envy. And, uh, and again, a lot of it is. Let's stop there. Slander. For just it's a second. slander. It's slander like this. and envy. <clears throat> envy, man. It's envy. Dude, don't, don't bring up envy. <laughs> What if, what if it's, it's not? not though? <laughs> what if it's not? Right. Uh, I know you got to get rolling. I might finish the the video here solo, but let. No, uh, that's great. I want you to. You're on vacation, so I really appreciate the time that you've been able to give us here. Um, but any, yeah. anything you want to plug? You want to plug the podcast and and everything else? Yeah. Uh, Go check out uh, Full Proof Theology podcast. F U L L Proof Theology. Uh, I try to do long form interviews with different thinkers uh, who are writing books, like Andrew, or or writing articles, or uh, you know, anything like that. I, I try to have a pretty, believe it or not, pretty wide, wide spectrum of people I per permit to come on my show as yeah. the Lord Emperor of my podcast. So you can go find that, follow me on Twitter. Uh, but yeah, just last thought on this. I mean, he's, he's slandering and imputing motives uh, mm -hmm. left and right about, you know, they're, they're always the people with the biggest platforms are always going to complain about other people that are trying to build platforms. I saw this all yeah. the time at church conferences. The, the people that are up on the stage, they get to go on the cruises and teach their latest book, they're gonna look down at you and they're gonna say, if you have any ambition to do what I'm doing, well, that's selfish and you need to repent oh, yeah. of that. It's it's wild. It, it is incredibly, talk about lack of self-awareness, which is what he yeah. has imputed again and slandered people. It's it's just totally inconsistent. And yeah, maybe there's some guy out there who, 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 who has these selfish motives, but what I'm seeing is, I wish every pastor had a podcast was producing conservative pastor was producing a podcast uh fighting arguing uh discussing all these things but instead what you're going to get from these eggheads is uh you know they have power and we do not uh even though they think they need to respond to us because we're gaining power mm -hmm. and and yet it's always done with the most ill-conceived uh notions and intentions and immaturity and it's mm -hmm. like you can't win you're not going to no. win. And that's why I've written off Big Eva. That's why I got no. blocked by the Gospel Coalition on Twitter. It's like, I'm done. Like, I'm done <laughs> trying to, like, pretending these are good faith people. They're not good faith people. I'm happy to have them on my podcast. You're happy to fight them in real life. <laughs> like, I'm, I wasn't going to fight. I just want to be in the same room. <laughs> I want to I want to test his theory, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, I like, hey, look, I'm, I'm happy to have a conversation. But these guys are not going to do that. They're not going to do that. They're going to keep running yeah. this playbook right into the ground until America is a communist hellhole. And I'm like, yeah. no, I'm not going to do that anymore. Done. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, check out the pod. Check out Amen. Twitter. Uh, good, good stuff here, Andrew. Thank you.
Yeah, thanks for joining us, and I'll, I'll roll solo here. So thanks, Chase. I'll, I'll see you. We'll have you back uh, for a regular episode uh, to discuss, <laughs> and, and then CJ, CJ will be here, and he'll, he'll ask you all sorts of way better questions than I will. So thanks, Chase. Times. All right, see you, man. All right, we're going to go back to Ligon Duncan. We'll finish this off here. Is driven by a desire to be important. Yeah. They're very unimportant people who want to be important. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's it right there. Again, what Chase just said before he signed off, right? Very unimportant. They want to feel important, right? So I think, you know, like me or any, any, any of you guys in the chat watching this, right? He, he's imputing these, these motives to us. He's saying, right, you want to be important. And I'm like, I don't, I was, I was a non on Twitter for the longest time. I didn't want people to know my name. I don't want people to know who I am. And I, I frankly, you know, don't. Still, I don't, I don't do this and Chase doesn't do this. And all these guys don't do this because they want to be famous and they want, I, I don't want to be the chancellor of RTS, right? I don't want to, to have these things. Um, I, I want my people to be defended, right? I want the people in my church to not be treated like scum. I want the people in my community not to be destroyed. That's, that's why we do this stuff. Not, not because I, I think, oh man, wouldn't it be cool if I had a tie as nice as Liggett Duncan's? No, like that's, that's absurd. Brother, you have a heart out at 740. <laughs> uh, let me ask you this. You, you will not hurt my feelings. I wanted to get your thoughts on theonomy. I doubt you can answer that in one minute. Do you have another minute to answer that or should we just cut it right no, let's, let's go. Okay. Let's go. I'm, I'm, I'm yours. I'm you here. will not hurt my feelings no, if you say I'm I just got to go. Uh, you know, I wrote on theonomy uh, as a young professor at RTS in the early 1990s. You know, Greg Bonson wrote Theonomy and Christian Ethics while he was a professor at RTS Jackson in the mid-1970s. I did not know that. So theonomy was a ground zero kind of issue when I came to RTS Jackson. And so I, I had to develop a lecture for it in my ethics course. And that eventually became a book which I finished in 1995 or 1996. But by that time, theonomy was already in retreat in reform yeah. circles. Yeah. And so I put it on the shelf and I thought this will never be relevant again mm. for the rest of my life. And then behold, you know, from for the, for the last seven years or so, yeah. you know, I see the zombie coming out of the of the great force and uh so I, I, I actually jonathan lehman reached out and asked if we could republish some of that material in the nine marks for the journal, magazine yeah. on, on reconstructionism i said absolutely and i've realized i need to address that again so i i would say that um theonomy and the the larger reconstruction movement mm -hmm. around it was a well-meaning but misguided cultural overreaction to uh, some some theological things in American culture and to some and to some cultural and political things in American culture. I think that if if you look at the time when theonomy is developing, Rush Dooney, North, Bonson, the you know the original folks that sort of spread the word, mm -hmm. uh, the dominant theology of evangelicalism in those days was dispensational antinomianism. Yeah. And so it, it's it's almost like okay, we're gonna do the opposite. And the, and and a lot of neutral public square talk. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 then at, at the same time there was a there was a there was a gradual rise of the of the sort of conservative movement in America mm -hmm. through you know from before Reagan through. So yeah, he says this right. He says this about the economy, and, and and it's more or less accurate. It's framed in a not a great way, but um, he says this right. And there, so we're not going to do that. We're not going to react to you know the antinomianism of of you know the contemporary evangelicalism of the mainstream of evangelicalism. We're going to work to react to that. Right. We're, and we're going to definitely reject because we just think it's the antithesis of it, but they, they, there is no synthesis. There is no, all right, we're going to, we're going to combat it in the right way. Right. What's the alternative uh, to Bonson and North and Rush Dooney, right? They didn't, what was their alternative? There wasn't one there. There wasn't anything, anything substantive whatsoever. Reagan, moral and, majority, you know, yeah. and then the moral majority, yeah. and a, and a lot of these folks ended up being advisors to some you know fairly significant public figures and, and politicians. Yeah. And I think there was a uh, there there was a a, a very optimistic post millennial expectation that we're going to not only take back this country, we're actually going to establish you know a, a, the, you know, a theonomic. Yeah. Uh, we're really doing state, it. Yeah, and we're going to do it. The Puritans uh, will be proud. There you go. And and so that I think that was the background. I think what's happening now, uh, it, it, we've never been further away from that possibility in our culture than yeah. we are now. And uh, just like the abortion abolition movement, you know, Roe v. Wade gets struck down and suddenly there's an abortion abolition movement. Mm. And you go, oh, like, where were you like for the last 50 years? Yeah. While oh, good grief. Right. Where were they? They, they? they always existed, man. Like, where were you, Lincoln Duncan? Where, where were you? This, is, this has been a thing for a very long time. And, and it didn't just spring up out of the Dobbs decision. What, what planet do you live on? Like what rock do you live under or, or rather right, how far up is this ivory tower 
that you live in, Lincoln Duncan. This is this is nuts. All, all these evangelical pro-life people were out here, you know, scraping and clawing and trying to do what they could do yeah. to, uh, to to roll back Roe v. Wade. Same thing with with Reconstructionism. You you know, just like you were saying, friends from other and and the big like he's he's promoting the pro-life movement, right? The pro-life movement was an encumbrance to overturning Roe v. Wade, right? I don't know if all you guys you you can you can mention in the chat if you want. If you if you guys remember 2015 when Trump kind of you know you know, was bobbing and weaving with Chris Matthews and, uh, you know, saying what he thought about abortion, right. Try, trying to tell evangelicals what they wanted to hear. And he says, yeah, there has to be some punishment if we outlaw abortion and the freak out that happened from, you know, the big pro-life movement universally from guy from big Eva, from guys like Lincoln Duncan was massive. It was humongous. And wouldn't you know it, right. The one guy who isn't really pro-life in really any way, he was just practicing retail politics. He's the one that gets Roe v. Wade overturned, right? That's not a coincidence, not a coincidence at all, right? We had the pro-life movement had to be stepped over in order for this to happen. Countries look at this like like talk to your Chinese friends. Yeah. How impractical is this? Yeah. It's utterly impractical uh, in 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 most parts of the world. Even think in these ways. And so you, again, you can be really brave, and you can have these really strong opinions, and you can you can think you're really pure, and you, you're you're the you're the one true believer in everyone's midst. And it's it's there's no possibility of this being implemented uh, in any possible world. Yeah. And uh, man, this is just this is just sad. Right. There's no possibility this could ever happen. Right. There's no possibility we could actually have Christian laws in the world. Right. That that outlaw something utterly abhorrent. No, that's never going to happen. So th that's one thing that's going on. Th theologically, theonomic re reconstructionism is not a reformed view. That's you will just not they will they will go back and try and cite magisterial reformers and they mm. will cite them incorrectly. Mm. It is true that there was a shift in the 16th and 17th century Reformation in its views of church state relations. Mm -hmm. And its views of how the Ten Commandments were to be uh, applied in society, and it is true that there was a shift from Britain to America in the Reformed mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. uh, so Baptists and Presbyterians were being thrown in jail in the American colonies yeah. by Anglicans and by Congregationalists. Yeah, whipped, and Baptists yeah. and Presbyterians thought, you know, it's really not a good idea for Massachusetts Bay Colony to be a Congregationalist establishment thing where we get thrown into prison, or Virginia to be an Anglican mm -hmm. colony where we get thrown into prison. We actually believe in freedom of the exercise of religion. Yeah. And uh, and that's a good thing, not a bad thing. It's not infidelity and pluralism. It's a good thing yeah. for the gospel because you don't want people having their consciences forced yeah. in the most important area of all of life. And you've got all of the history of the religious wars behind that. And so there's a real sense in which Protestants invented religious freedom. And in America, Baptists and Presbyterians really forged the consensus that came about on religious freedom. And now you've got a group, you know, sort of wanting to call that in question. Let's go back to monarchy. Let's go back to, uh, you know, to, to state sponsored persecution, et cetera, et cetera. That's the way to be really faithful. And it's, it's very childish um, yeah. to me. It also feels, it feels like a, a visceral response. America, this thing that we've loved for so long that we felt in control of, we're losing that. Yeah. We're terrified. And listen, yeah. I get it. I don't want drag queen story hour any yeah. more than you do. But as good Bible guys, we're the reform guys, we can't just say, let's take America back. That feels carnal. It's almost like theonomy allows us to baptize that instinct. Yeah. Well, now I'm trying to find theological rationale for this right. impulse, you know? So I can actually say, no, me fighting to save the country is a biblical yeah. thing. Yeah. Brother, we could talk so much more. You That's it right there. This, uh, you know, dime store, uh, uh, Stephen Furtick, uh, the point that he made is, is accurate, right? The woke big Eva are more correct than the mainstream, right? They, they get it. They get that what's at stake here, that actually it is a biblical thing to not want your country to be a communist hellhole, right? They get, they get that. <laughs> they disagree <laughs> strenuously, but they get that that's what we think, right? That that's fine, that it's good, right? Not just fine, that it's accurate, that that's what we should want, right? They get these things and uh, they're just opposed to it, right? Their solution Right. They don't present one. Their solution is just sit back and take it. Just let it happen. You have to go. I'm so thankful, honored, uh, humble that you would take the time to do this. Uh, let me pray and ask the Lord to bless. All right. We'll 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 skip their closing prayer that sanctifies this uh, this session. But my goodness. Uh, well, well, guys, I mean, that was that was it. Uh, it was it was exactly what I thought we both uh, Chase and, and I. You know, we didn't uh, we didn't watch this beforehand. We watched some clips, and that was it. So I had to see the full thing in context and react fresh for all of you guys. But man, this is uh, this is this is what Big Eva is, right? This is a, a an inside look at the belly of the beast and what these guys actually believe and how they how they behave, how they act. Um, so 
I hope you liked our, our live reaction to this abomination. Uh, if you did, you know, please like and share and subscribe, uh, not because we want to have massive institutional power and envious of these guys, but because we want our people supported. We want the things that we believe, the things that we're fighting for to, to, to grow. Uh, so please, you know, like, share, subscribe, uh, review on, if you're listening on audio, review it on, on Apple and Spotify and things like that. We really appreciate it. Uh, CJ and I will be back. Um, as long as our airplanes don't crash, uh, Ligon Duncan probably doesn't care about that either. Uh, as long as our airplanes don't crash, uh, we'll be, we'll be live and in person on Friday. So, uh, you want to check that out as well, but until, until next time, uh, stay dangerous peacefully and we will see you next time.